Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the class on 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon. Uh, we finished studying 1st uh, Timothy. We began um, last Monday looking at uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy and, uh, you know, we uh, looked at uh, verses 1 to 8 in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We will continue on uh, from verse 9 onwards. Uh, but before that, let's just pause for a word of prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Shall I pray, ma'am? Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Heavenly and gracious Father God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, as we bow down to you, Father, in adoration and admiration for who you are and how you lead us day after day in your word, in your truth, we thank you for this platform. We thank you for Pastor. We thank you for the word that we have so handy in our hands, Father that we have no way to escape, no way to make excuses, Father. But as we are learning deeply your truth, Father, Lord, may it enrich us, may it empower us, equip us to do your will on this earth, do mighty exploits for your kingdom, to bring many, many souls to, uh, to your kingdom, Father, and be a vessel of mercy, glory, and honor to your name, Father. Use us for your glory as we receive the word. Help us to apply it in our lives in daily walk with you, Father, and glorify your name in every word, action, and deed, Father. We surrender this class, our learning, and our teacher into your hands, Father. And Father, we are prepared. Prepare our hearts to receive the word. We give you glory. We give you honor and praise for everyone who is part of this movement. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so, 2 Timothy is uh, more a personal letter of Paul uh, to his son in the faith, his mentor, uh, uh, you know, the one he was mentoring, uh, who is Timothy. And so, Paul is disclosing more about his own personal life and ministry. And as he's doing that, even as he's disclosing his own personal, about his own personal life and ministry, he's teaching an other man of God how to be a servant of God and how to live as a man of um, God. Uh, First Timothy is more about, you know, how Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him how he needs to take a, uh, take care of the local church, more administrative kind of a letter. But this uh, second letter to Timothy is more a personal letter where Paul is just pouring out his own life, his own ministry, and he's teaching Timothy how to be uh, efficient uh, and a good servant of God and how to live uh, his life as a man of uh, God. Okay. So in verses 1 to 8, we basically uh, saw, you know, how um, or we read, uh, you know, Paul, uh, Apostle Paul telling Timothy, uh, you know, that uh, he needs to uh, stir up the gift that is, uh, he has received the laying on of hands. Uh, he also tells him to, uh, you know, not to neglect the gift that is in him, which is given to prophecy. Um, uh, and, you know, he tells him to, uh, that he's not given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Uh, and that is where uh, we what we looked at uh, in verse 7. And then he goes on to tell him in verse 8, you know, not to be ashamed um, of the testimony of our Lord or uh, of, you know, be ashamed of Paul as his prisoner, but share in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of uh, God. Okay, so we look, we stopped at verse 8. We'll continue with verse 9. Can one of you please read verse 9, please? Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Amen. Thank you, Divya. So here, this is a fully loaded verse. You know, it's telling us that 
uh, if we are saved or when we are saved, we are also called. And what are we called to? We are called to a holy living. Uh, we are called to holiness. We are called to live a morally pure uh, lives. So, you know, when we are saved, God calls us. He calls us to his for his own purpose, uh, to fulfill the purpose that he has ordained for our lives, even before time began, uh, like it says here, you know, uh, it's given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, you know, the plans and the purposes that God has for our lives was something that he thought about, he ordained even before uh, time began. And we studied uh, uh, this in the course, you know, fulfilling God's purpose for your life in the first year. And um, we know that God has a plan and a purpose. And even as he has called us, and he has, you know, has a purpose for us. Uh, we also learned that he gives us the grace. Uh, he gives us the grace that will enable us, that will equip us, that will strengthen us, strengthen us, that will empower us uh, to fulfill his calling, his purpose uh, in our um, lives. Okay, so he gives us the grace to walk in that call and purpose that he has called us to and he is he, he gives us a grace to enable us to fulfill uh, the calling and the purpose that he has on our uh, life verse 10 can one of you please read verse 10 please can i read pastor yes just go ahead yeah i can read but has now been revealed by the appearing of our savior jesus christ who has abolished death and brought life and morality to the light through the gospel Amen. Thank you, Asha. So Paul knows that, you know, he's um, uh, going to be uh, dying soon, that uh, death is very inevitable. Uh, it's just looming large on him. Uh, but he says that Jesus is his savior. And he says that, uh, you know, he has life and immortality uh, through the gospel. And he, he's, he mentions here that the Lord Jesus Christ is our savior, which means that, you know, uh, the appearing of Jesus, you know, or Jesus, uh, you know, God becoming man, incarnation, you know, revealed the purpose uh, uh, of uh, God to us. It reveals God's purpose of redeeming mankind back to himself. His, uh, it revealed to us the whole uh, uh, purpose of God, of salvation, of how to save mankind from their sin, even as he sent uh, Jesus, even as uh, God became incarnate. So the appearing of Jesus revealed uh, the purpose of God, uh, you know, how when, when Jesus went about fulfilling the eternal plan of God, when he died on the cross, when he took upon our sins, uh, it just revealed to mankind God's eternal plan, uh, his purpose for our lives, how he wanted to save us from sin um, and, uh, you know, uh, and redeem us uh, from sin, Satan, and um, and from death, and to bring us uh, to eternal life, to draw us back to uh, Him. So everything that Jesus did here on this earth, you know, truly shows us uh, what God's plan was, uh, and also it talks about the grace of God. You know, the divine enablement, the divine favor, the divine empowering of God. Even as uh, He empowered uh, Jesus. Um, and, uh, you know, Jesus had that favor, that did not, the divine enablement, the divine empowering to go about fulfilling uh, the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption, the eternal plan of God. Uh, so the, the very appearing of Jesus, you know, uh, reveals to us the purpose and the grace of God. And also, you know, he's... Um, He's telling Timothy that uh, in the same way, you know, God has given me a call. You know, he has a purpose for my life. And um, and even as he has a call and a purpose, his grace is upon me. And so he's just reminding Timothy that you too have a call. You too have a purpose. And uh, just as uh, God Almighty enabled Jesus to fulfill that uh, purpose and the call that he had on his life and gave him the grace. Uh, remember you studied in uh, in, in um, the first year, you know, grace basically talks about divine enablement, divine empowering and divine uh, favor. These three characteristics are, um, are the very 
core things of what grace means uh you know so you too will have the divine enablement the divine empowerment and the divine favor to accomplish what god has called you even uh, as you are in a position of responsibility that is uh, difficult that is challenging um and you know uh, timothy just wants to leave his post and come back to be with paul but paul is reminding him of uh, you know his calling and his purpose and the grace that comes along and how jesus himself you know uh, fulfilled uh, the calling and the purpose upon his life because the grace of god that was on him and he says that he has abolished which means he is completely and uh, definitely caused to cease death and uh, instead of death, you know, Jesus came to bring about uh, and give us life. And he's talking here about Zoe, uh, the God kind of life, the fullness of life, the life that God has in himself. And also because of God, uh, what Jesus uh, fulfilled, the eternal plan and the purpose of God, because of that, you know, death has been abolished and we have a life of God, the Zoe life of God, and also immortality, which means, uh, you know, we will be raised up to bodies that are incorruptible, and we will have an unending existence. And he says this all through the gospel. So he's saying, you know, what you are preaching and teaching um, is something that is of greater eternal significance, greatest price, uh, because it is something that is abolished that uh, and is uh, giving us, going to give life to people, the God kind of life, the fullness of life, the Zoe life, and also going to bring about immortality, even as you labor for the gospel, even as you preach and teach the uh, gospel. Okay, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12 says, and this is a testimony uh, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life and whoever does not have this son of god does not have life so this eternal life is in the sun and the sun has given us this eternal life so life and immortality you know uh, we will experience uh, when we are resurrected uh, it's a future inheritance uh, at the resurrection as we read in uh, first thessalonians chapter 4 uh, verses 13 uh, to 18 and first corinthians chapter 15 verses uh, 51 to 58 you know uh, where it says you know the perishable will uh, be raised imperishable the corruptible will be raised incorruptible uh, and uh, you know um, uh, mortality will put on immortality so you know the lord himself you know will come down uh, you know, and the dead in Christ will arise and uh, all of these things will happen. What will we put on immortality uh, and all of that, what we read in First Corinthians chapter 15 and First Thessalonians chapter 4. So he's saying this is the hope that we have in the uh, gospel. Now, it's, uh, it's amazing that Paul is writing all of that so you can see the great hope hope that he has a great joy in the midst of uh, the challenge that he's facing in the midst of uh, death that is so evident that is uh, just upon him looming large upon him but he has this wonderful assurance and just look at him the way he's um, you know talking about the calling the purpose fulfilling it the grace of god that is going to enable them even as they are in different situations the grace of god that is going to enable them and also the future hope that they have and he's saying you know uh, 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 you know, he's giving us profound truths about really what the gospel is all about and why is it worth pursuing this gospel, preaching this gospel, teaching this gospel, even the point when you're persecuted, even the point when you're falling, uh, facing challenges and difficulties and you want to feel like giving up and giving up on ministry, walking back and all of those things. But look at what is the hope of the gospel and what he talks about uh, the truth about the gospel what it uh, uh, has in store for us and what it can the blessings it can bring about for uh, us so that is verse 10 uh, verse 11 can uh, verse 11 and 12 can one of you please read verse 11 and 12 please verse 11 and 12 mm -hmm. 
for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until the day what has been entrusted to me. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Rupa. So here, you know, Paul is again stating his calling to his gen to the Gentiles, and he's saying that you know this gospel is so much, so precious, so worthy, uh, so much uh, worthy of even just laying down our very lives for it. And he's saying that is what I've been doing all of my life, uh, preaching it, teaching it, uh, because it is is so priceless. It is so. Uh, is so great it has such great eternal uh, significance and then he goes on in verse 12 to say you know um, for this reason I suffer these things so he's he's telling Timothy that you know a Christian uh, life or a life of a believer or a servant of God is not uh, you know exempt from suffering hardships uh, oppositions persecutions difficulties challenges you know it's all part and parcel of uh, receiving the blessings the eternal hope that we have uh, the eternal blessings uh, experiencing it uh, even now but also it comes along with uh, hardships difficulties uh, challenges and uh, persecutions and he's saying you know look at me you know uh, why am i in prison not because i'm an evil man or i've done evil things or bad things but he's saying you know I'm in prison now suffering uh, because of the gospel and he says but I am not ashamed of the uh, uh, gospel and we also read in verse 8 you know how Paul encouraged Timothy not to be ashamed of the gospel he tells him in verse 8 therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor me uh, his prisoner but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God so we looked at how you know Paul is saying that even in that uh, time of persecution and difficulty and challenge he's ex experiencing the power of God so I remember I said we don't only experience the power of God when we are preaching or teaching or doing evangelism or uh, you know praying for a sick person or you know trying to flow in a, a manifest that gives the spirit we also experience the power of God when we go through sufferings and uh, challenges and difficulties and uh, persecution okay and then Paul goes on to, uh, uh, you know, make his own statement of why he is not uh, ashamed to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Now, the obvious reason why he is not ashamed of uh, suffering for the gospel is the fact that, you know, Paul is, you know, already feels empowered supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is, he's all, he's already said that, you know, um, uh, that the grace of God is available, the power of God is available, he knows that. But he also states two additional reasons um, why he is not ashamed to suffer for the sake of the gospel. The first reason he gives is, he says, I know whom I have believed, which means he's saying that, you know, I have believed in Jesus, the Savior, and, uh, you know, like he has mentioned in, in verse 1 and verse 2, he says, the Savior, uh, who is Jesus Christ, he's the source of all grace, mercy, and truth, and uh, and like he has just mentioned in, uh, in verse, um, uh, you know, in verse 10, where he says, you know, the Savior has... Um, uh, you know, has given me life and immortality, the promise of life, eternal life, the Zoe life and immort immortality. And in, and the second thing he says is that he says, uh, I not only believe that, you know, Jesus Christ is a savior, that he's the source of all grace, mercy and truth, that he has uh, given him the promise of life and immortality. But he says, you know, the second reason he says is he says that, he knows uh, he is able to uh, keep what I have committed to him. That means he's saying that, you know, I have entrusted, I have given, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus or God, you know, uh, I've committed some things to them, entrusted to keep, ask them to keep uh, some things. And I know that, you know, it will be guarded, uh, it will be uh, protected, and they're able to keep what I have committed uh, to him. So he says he's, uh, he's very sure that, you know, God is able to protect 
to safeguard, to keep um, what he has committed to him until that day. And what has Paul committed uh, uh, to God uh, to protect, to safeguard, to keep his very life, uh, eternal life that he has received as a result of his encounter on the road to Damascus. He says, I have placed my life in his hands. And he says, I know that this God is more than worthy, more than able to keep what I have entrusted to him. Now, we can look at this verse in um, in two ways. It can be rendered in two ways, um, and both these ways can be true. Uh, one way of looking at it is that God is able to guard what has been committed by me to him. So even as you entrust your very life to God, uh, your eternal life is salvation to him. He is more than uh, able to guard, to protect, to safeguard, to keep what you have committed to him. And is also able to guard what has been committed uh, to me by him. So whatever God has given us uh, to guard, you know, uh, whether it's the uh, the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the doctrines in the gospel, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, how to manifest the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, all that has the uh, the the treasures or the mysteries, the revelations of the truth in God's word that God has entrusted to us, even what He has entrusted entrusted to us, He is able to protect, safeguard, and to keep. Uh, you know, uh, what he has given to us and also what we have uh, given to him. So isn't that wonderful that even as, um, you know, God has given us uh, all of these things uh, as the sources, his gospel is true, his doctrines, the revelations from his word, um, the gifts of the spirit that, uh, you know, we don't have to protect it and guard it. He is able to empower us, to strengthen us, enable us. Uh, to guard, to protect, to keep uh, these truths, these revelations, and to teach it in the right way uh, so that people are edified and uh, uh, strengthened. So this is so amazing about the God that we serve, that he just does not call us and give us a purpose and leave us on our own to do what we are supposed to do, but he gives us the divine grace uh, that we need. Um, uh, the divine enablement, the divine empowerment, the strength, uh, the favor, the wisdom, and also is able to guard and protect so that we don't, uh, you know, uh, diverse from the truth. We don't go off in an, uh, another way, another angle, and also don't uh, use um, uh, the gifts that he has given to us uh, to misuse it, uh, which will be a great hindrance for his kingdom. Okay, so this is why, you know, uh, he, the two reasons that he gives um, uh, that he is not ashamed to suffer for the sake of the uh, gospel. Uh, verse 13, can somebody read verse 13, please? Hold fast the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he's saying, uh, you know, uh, continuing to talk about what he has already spoken in First Timothy, you know, the one reason that Paul has assigned Timothy to Ephesus is to protect the church from all kinds of false teachers, false teachings. And we saw this even as we studied First Timothy. Uh, but secondly, we also learned in First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to to where Paul is uh, telling or warning Timothy that, you know, uh, that there are seducing spirits and these seducing spirits are giving rise to false doctrines and teach uh, teachings. And these seducing spirits and demons are actually uh, infiltrating the church uh, through the leaders who are Jews and to their wrong teachings, their false teachings, you know, they're being seduced and they're seducing others and they're leading them away from the faith. And then Paul is reminding Timothy again, he's coming back to the core topic, the core main point of what, uh, you know, he wants uh, Timothy to focus on. And he says, you know, Timothy, stay with the teachings that you have received, what you have learned uh, from your childhood, from your 
your mother, from your grandmother, from what you have um, heard me teach and you have learned the doctrines and truths. Stay with those. Don't digress. Don't move away. You know, uh, 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 just teach what is necessary to be taught the truth, the right uh, doctrines. And then he says something very important. He says, walk in faith and love in Christ Jesus. Okay. So Timothy's faithfulness has to be tempered with faith and love his faithfulness to teaching the gospel the truths the doctrines faithfulness of living his own life has to be tempered uh, with faith and love which are in christ jesus now um, some people you know uh, take god's word and consider it uh, uh, some as only something that is an intellectual matter and they leave out faith and um, love but faith and love basically you know describes how the truth has to be held how you know we hold on to the doctrines the truth the revelations in god's word have to be hold held on uh, with faith and love if you hold it in faith you know truly believing it and putting our lives on it and we uh, you know then we whatever challenges that we face whatever difficulties you know, uh, we will just hold on to these truths, this uh, and uh, these revelations from God's word, these doctrines, uh, because we just believe it hundred percent, and we just put our lives on it. We're willing to even give up our lives for this truth, uh, because of the faith that we have that this is God's truth. This is His word. This is His revelation. And uh, we hold it in love. When we hold it in love, you know, we do not become proud that we are super spiritual, that we know things more than others, um, you know, or, uh, you know, it doesn't bring about a sense of spiritual pride, spiritual arrogance, uh, looking down on others, talking down on others making fun of others and also will not bring us to a place where we will seek a superiority, a self-seeking superiority, uh, where we think we are better than others, we are more spiritual. Uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, like the Pharisees in Jesus' time, you know, they were so committed to holding on to certain teachings and rituals and they would do everything, they would dress in that way, they would, you know, uh, 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 come to the temple they would pray aloud uh you know the corner of the street they would just pray and all of those things uh but if you really look at their actions there was no fruit in their life there was no faith there was no love that was evident in their lives they had no love for people and uh, their whole religiosity or their uh you know their uh, actions their way of doing things uh did not bring about faith in God. They did not have faith in God. And that's why, <clears throat> sorry, that is why, you know, they um, they didn't even, were not even able to recognize who the Messiah was. They failed uh, to put their faith and trust in uh, Jesus. So, you know, uh, if one thinks that they're faithful to the truth, uh, you know, you can hold on to the truth and you can be, become come to a point where we become so legalistic, you know, uh, uh, rather than showing faith and love, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, it's like nothing. And what does Jesus call them? He calls them, you know, these whitewashed tombs that look so beautiful on the outside, but inside is just decay and dead bones and, uh, you know, dust. Uh, so it's important that even as we hold on to the truths you know we hold it on in faith and in love which are in uh, christ jesus and we see that even in jesus's life you know he held on to the truth he knew scripture very well uh, but he was compassionate he was gracious he was merciful and when they said the law required us to do this 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 with this woman uh, what do you say what did Jesus do? You know, if you are anyone without sin, take the first stone and throw it. And then he says, you know, everyone is gone. He says, um, either do I condemn you, go and live your life uh, uh, free from sin. So we see that, you know, how did Jesus's truth of uh, the scripture translate in his life? There was fruit. Okay. It, it showed itself in faith. He had total faith in his father and what his father is asking him to do say where he wants to go so that's why he kept on saying i only do what my father says i only go where my father asked me to go i only uh, 
uh, say what my father asked me to say and we also see uh, his faith translated in his relationship with the father and also love for people uh, through which he manifested uh, the love of God the father and also you know showed uh, what faith is so that is what the truth of the gospel the word of God should do in our lives it should not just bring about legalistic ritualism you know to a point where we're becoming so ritualistic and that was so sad for the Jews you know they became so ritualistic in following the uh, uh, rules and laws that they had no faith in God and they had no love and that's why God says I will remove that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will write my laws upon your heart and mind and the Holy Spirit will cause you to obey it uh, out of love and out of faith okay any questions so far well, are you able to understand any questions? Okay, I'll take the quiet uh, for a no. Uh, okay, so we'll move on to verse um, uh, 14. Can one of you please read 14, please? That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the holy spirit who dwells in you amen amen thank you stavani so yes he uh paul is telling timothy you know what he needs to guard he needs to guard what has been committed to him uh this is something that he's already told him in first timothy chapter 6 verse 20. Uh, remember he says god guard what was committed to your trust and he says you can guard what is committed to your trust or, uh, you know, what is committed to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. So he's basically encouraging Timothy, uh, you know, uh, giving him uh, uh, examples of how he has been living his own life. How has, uh, you know, Paul guarded what God has called him to, even his very calling, you know. He's faced so much of persecution and shipwreck and beatings and sloggings and all of those things. But why was he so committed? Uh, because, you know, um, he knows that, you know, uh, uh, to whom he has committed his life and um, he is able to guard what he has committed. And also that, you know, Paul is able to uh, go about doing ministry because the one who has committed him the task, has given him the task, is able to guard and protect and safeguard him. And that is the assurance that, um, you know, uh, Paul has had. So he has been able to, you know, guard what God has given to him, you know, the truth in the, in the, in the gospel, the doctrines, uh, his calling to the Gentiles, um, even in in the in the midst of persecution and difficulties why because through the enabling power of the holy spirit because it is the holy spirit is god himself who's enabling him guarding him protecting him safeguarding him uh, to uh, you know to fulfill uh, what his calling his purpose is uh, by giving him the grace that is uh, required so we need to you know, coming back to the same thing you know reiterating it because this is so important for us you know each one of us have a calling and a purpose and sometimes we think we are you know uh, we are left alone, God is not responding, we can't see God working, God moving, we just feel like quitting, but just know that the grace of God comes along with his uh, you know, calling and his purpose, because that is what um, uh, his word uh, says, and that is the reality in Paul's life, and he's trying to reiterate this truth and tell this uh, to Timothy himself and this is a powerful truth that we can remind ourselves um, as well so he's saying that you know uh, even as the Holy Spirit is the one who uh, guides us into all truth like we read in um, John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 when uh, Jesus teaches uh, his disciples who the Holy Spirit is he says he will guide you into all truth so you know uh, the same way that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to guard the word uh, within us we need the Holy Spirit's uh, anointing he we need his guidance uh, to guard what uh, you know he has deposited uh, in us so even as you have been deposited with so much of learnings the last three years and all through your life uh, the so many uh, past years of your life you know um, ask the Holy Spirit to guard 
uh, you know, what is there to remind you of these truths, to speak these truths, to, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, to give you that uh, the right truth, the right revelation to speak uh, when, where, you know, which season of life, to whom, uh, when to preach it. So, you know, um, just ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance and anointing so that you can, you uh, you know, preserve this truth and walk in this truth, live this truth, and also teach it in faith and uh, truth. Okay. Uh, Elisha says, By the power of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost, we preserve the faith of the fathers that has been handed uh, to us. Yes. And we also preserve the truth of the Word of God. You know, we preserve the gospel, the truth, the doctrines in God's Word. It's only through His guidance and through His. Uh, anointing. Uh, if we look at 1 John chapter 2 verses 20 and 27, it tells us, um, you know, it's the anointing within that will teach us what is right and uh, wrong. I'm just, you know, mentioning these things because we don't have time to go into all of the scripture passages, but it will be good to read uh, 1 John chapter 2 verses 20 and verse 27 where it says the anointing within us you know what is the anointing, right? Anointing is basically the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is what will teach us what is right and wrong and also help us to teach God's word. Uh, verse 15 and then was, uh, can somebody please read verses 15 to verse 18, please? This year, no. That, that all those in Asia have turned away from me from service. Can I read? Yeah, go ahead, Kung. We can hear you now. Okay. Does he know that all those in Asia have turned away from me from uh, from among whom are uh, Figilius and the uh, Harmodius? The Lord grant mercy to the household of. Um, for this, uh, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord granted him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many uh, how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Amen. Thank you, Kung. So here, you know, Paul, uh, uh, you know, it from his writing, we can know that many believers in Asia Minor have deserted him or abandoned him, uh, you know, uh, abandoned their friendship, their association with Apostle Paul because of his imprisonment. They were scared that, you know, now uh, because he's in, he's in chains because the gospel, then, you know, uh, Nero, who's already persecuting the Christians, will find out about his fellow co-workers, fellow laborers and friends and also have them in prison. So many of them abandoned their friendship with Paul and it was very heartbreaking for Paul, you know, um, and he mentions two of them, Phygelius and Hermogenes, and he says, you know, he mentions these two names, men who seem to have abandoned their friendship with Paul. Uh, we do not know anything much about these two, but only uh, these names. Maybe you know, Timothy knew them well, and so he uh, he's specifically mentioning it or writing it uh, to uh, Timothy. So um, it's no wonder, you know, that Paul firmly uh, is uh, encouraging Timothy not to be ashamed of, um, of speaking of the gospel, ashamed of being identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, or teaching the gospel, uh, or sharing about the Lord Jesus Christ, or even being associated with Paul, even as he has mentioned this uh, in uh, the preceding verses and in uh, the previous uh, letter that he has written. And then he talks about Onesiphorus, uh, you know, and he says, Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Uh, now this name Onesiphorus is not mentioned elsewhere, uh, but, you know, it's a wonderful thing what this man has done uh, for somebody like Paul, somebody in chains, somebody who's going through difficulties and challenges, um, 
So he mentions, you know, what Onesiphorus has done for him. He says, you know, he ministered to Paul when Paul was at Ephesus, you know, when uh, when Paul was at Rome. Uh, he came to Rome, he looked out for Paul, he searched for him, he found him out in uh, Rome, uh, and he's often refreshed Paul. And he says that, you know, Onesiphorus is one of them who's not ashamed of, uh, you know, knowing Paul or identifying him with him even as Paul is in uh, chain. So Onesiphorus, even though we do not know much about him, you know, a wonderful example for us to follow, you know, uh, even as we are uh, believers in the body of Christ, how we need to relate to other believers, to other saints in the body of Christ, you know, how we need to minister to them. Uh, you know, if um, if we know that they have left church, they've gone away, they moved away, how we can keep in touch with them, connect with them, uh, you know, um, uh, refresh people who are going through difficulties and challenges, how we can support them. And when they are being persecuted, how we can help them out, identify with them and, uh, you know, be a support system uh, to them okay so onesiphorus is a good example something that we can also uh, follow and imbibe as uh, believers in christ okay uh, the key takeaway for um, this uh, chapter one is you know verse eight uh, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our lord nor me his prisoner but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. So basically, do not be ashamed to witness the gospel, to teach Christ or to make him known. Okay, so that is uh, First Timothy chapter 1. Anyone has any thoughts, uh, any inputs you'd like to add, any questions, anything that you all didn't understand and you want me to explain again, you could ask. Yes, say. Yes, Pastor, thank you. Um, just clarity again more on um was paul just making a prayer for onifusurus uh when he said um may the lord grant that he will find mercy from the lord on that day i presume he's talking about the rapture the day of rapture um was it just a prayer or uh was it a declaration of what he wanted the lord to do for him when he appeared yeah, I think you could look at it in both ways, you know. Uh, uh, Paul already knows that Onesiphorus um, uh, was a believer and that what is the hope that he has uh, on the day of when 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 the Lord Jesus will come because he's been speaking about that in the preceding verses. He's talking about the hope that we have of immortality, so he's adding that in here. And also it could be, uh, you know, um, uh, yes, just that hope that uh, along with him, Onesiphorus also has the same hope. And also it could be a prayer that uh, he has or this great anticipation that they are all going to see each other on that uh, the day of the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. And another question is, um, I see here, you know, in verse 16 again, he says, may the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Um, does this go to show that there is more to mercy than just forgiveness um in the body of christ we've mainly said oh mercy is pardon for an offense why grace is um empowerment in in other words what you did not deserve like into a law court basically well it seems to be that there is still more to mercy in terms of maybe paul was here saying god should the household of only first for us in other words give them an advantage i don't know if that's right to say that there is more to mercy than just pardon for, for offenses that we can actually cry out for the mercy of god for giving us an advantage sparing us from harm i, I, I i'm just wondering what what do you think yeah it's a good um thought um it could mean also, yes, a grant mercy in the sense, uh, you know, to the household of Onesiphorus, because maybe they're already a believers. Um, uh, so they've also received forgiveness of sins and salvation. Mercy could also mean a blessing, you know, uh, just uh, 
the blessing of God to be upon them, uh, which comes because of God's grace and His mercy upon our life. We don't inherit blessings because of the works that we do. And Paul has, you know, elaborated on this in various of his epistles. Uh, and he knows uh, where we stand in terms of grace and mercy uh, in, uh, compared to uh, where we stand in works because that is what the Jews were looking for. But uh, so it could mean here mercy in terms of, you know, the, the Lord bless uh, the household of uh, Onesiphorus and may he receive God's blessing, uh, not because of what he is doing, because of his works, because he's going around refreshing someone like Paul, but because of his, not because of his works, but because of the grace of God um, that is upon each one of our lives. It could also be seen in that way. Did that help, Say? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Say. Uh, yes, Dibya. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Selina. I just wanted to share. Uh, something uh, that's related to verse 12 here, uh, which says, uh, uh, I trust the one to whom I'm entrusted, right? Um, so he, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, so we can see uh, Paul says there's even in Romans 1. And uh, uh, I love that verse very much where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's very beautiful to see the different perspectives that Paul brings in for not to be ashamed of the gospel. Many times mm, we hold back, you know, from sharing the gospel to others, thinking that, oh, uh, like as if we are in the center of it, but uh, the gospel is the center. Uh, uh, it should be the center of when we preach preach it. And yes, um, it has the power uh, for the salvation of everyone who believes. And also, yeah, it's so beautiful uh, as Paul brings it here. Like he completely trusts uh, the God uh, to whom he is entrusted. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if we take it in that perspective, uh, as you shared, Pastor Selena, as you said, like there are two ways of looking at it. Yeah, but if I take it in this way, yeah, it's very beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Divya. Yes, uh, Paul mentions the rights is in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Uh, yes, you know, um, just... Uh, his love for the gospel, because it has such a prominent place in his life, uh, what it has done. You know, uh, uh, Paul thought he was a very zealous, a very religious Jew. He was doing everything according to uh, what God required of him, uh, you know, but um, uh, it when he encountered, uh, uh, you know, Jesus on the road to Damascus, it brought about a different uh, enlightenment altogether that all of his religiosity, all of his zealousness uh, for, uh, you know, the, the Torah uh, was actually, uh, you know, filled with pride and self-arrogance. Uh, it was something on based on works, but, you know, just looking at the very life of Jesus, um, that it's not by works, but it's by grace. Uh, through faith was something that has caught him and the power of that gospel uh, which for which he is you know he just speaks about it he lives for it he's even willing to die for it yes very true um, so Elisha says in our time ministers of the gospel do not face similar persecutions as in the early church how do we uh, practicalize these wonderful affirmations of Onesiphorus to ministers of the gospel in our time. Uh, yes, in our if you look at in our country, there is a lot of persecution that is happening now. Uh, for Christ, two Christians, uh, uh, pastors, uh, and church uh, people as well. Uh, so you know this can apply in our Indian context because we are facing it. I know it's not uh, so uh, persecution is 
and not broken out in various other countries as well but um, you know uh, we can look at it in in the context of how when people uh, go through difficult difficult uh, challenges and struggles because standing up for the truth in the gospel like not paying bribes or you know not taking bribes or um, uh, you know uh, speaking the truth uh, uh, to the extent where even you know they can be put into prison um, and all of those things so how do we enable help them strengthen them uh, help them out or even if they go through challenges people go through various challenges in our church context believers small challenges big challenges people who lost their loved ones their husbands their their spouse their children you know how we can uh, you know uh, strengthen them help them people who have left the church because um, you know um, uh, people have hurt them or said something that is uh, not should have not been said or treated them in the wrong way but how we can connect back to them get back and you know get them back to church or how we can minister to their lives uh, can all be something that we can follow the example of Onesiphorus did that help uh, Elisha thank you Okay, we'll uh, come back after the break. It's time for a break and we'll, uh, uh, I'll just read out what Asha has written, her takeaways, and then we'll continue on with um, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2. Okay, we'll meet you after the break. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> 